Welcome to a new episode of Becoming a Post-Growth Planner, Obstacles and Challenges to Changing Roles and Practices. My name is Christian Lamker. I'm Assistant Professor for Sustainable Transformation and Regional Planning at the University of Groningen in the Netherlands. And today we are talking to Stephen Lighthizer. Stephen, can you introduce yourself? Yes, um, as Christian said, my name is Stephen uh, Lighthizer. I uh, just finished my PhD at the University of Groningen. And, um, well, the topic was um, surrounding uh, food, the commons, local governance and democracy. Some things we'll, I guess, talk about a little bit more today. And um, I just uh, started, uh, well, I'll be starting an April position as postdoc at uh, Wageningen University in the Department of Farming Systems Ecology. And uh, that's a project about agroecology and uh, bringing more uh, sustainable modes of food production um, to Europe. We basically started this conversation on your PhD defense in October 2022 in Groningen, where we talked about food commons, local governance, democracy, but also about some critical aspects of how we do research. And we will get back to that later, I'm sure. Um, and in one of your papers, you investigated how civic initiatives also attempt to common governance, looking into food policy councils, or in German, Ernährungsräte. And that's some fascinating insights about governance and also how we can or could redesign governance for the common good. Can you explain what you did and which obstacles you also observed on this pathway? For that uh, paper, um, I had... Um been looking at some food policy councils in Germany, as you said, uh, and then sort of from their discourse uh, that they were putting out, um, this idea of a gemeinwohl oriented uh, food system was centered so that in German, I guess, uh, oriented towards the common good. Um, and so that got me thinking, like, what is a food policy council actually trying to do? And what they were trying to do uh, is to transform uh, local governance, local food policy or some instances to create a food policy where there was none that was um, going to try to affect um, this focus on the common good in, in governance. So uh, if you ask like, how could we redesign governance for the common good? You first have to say what's governance. Well, that's just a process of coordinating people or institutions towards uh, agreed upon objectives objectives. Um, and normally here we think of like states or markets. So the state um, makes laws or uh, in a market, uh, people interact in a way of uh, pursuing their own self-interest. Um, and then this is sort of how we act collectively. Um, well, the idea of the common good is underlying both of these forms of governance, whether the state or the market. It's just more implicit. We assume that the state is making laws on the behalf of everyone, or we assume that um, acting in our own self-interest in the market will um, make all ships rise, or as Adam Smith has uh, called it, the invisible hand. So this idea is kind of implicit there. Um, but uh, as the food policy councils are pointing out with their um, idea of more common good-oriented food systems, it doesn't always happen in practice. Um, so if we ask then what would governance for the common good look like? Uh, that's more of a complicated question. Uh, there is no, I would say, universal common good. What's good for one person might not be good for another. And that has the tendency to sort of result in this aggregate approach that everyone just pursues their individual interest. And again, all ships will rise or the invisible hand kind of an idea. Um, as we know, um, well, because of the arguments the Food Policy Councils make, but we could say um, just because of um, the, the uh, effects of um, this sort of way of acting, we, we have yeah, tremendous ecological and social consequences. Uh, it's not actually a very democratic way of organizing society. Um, but what could we replace that with then? Um, I think we need to think of the common good as a vanishing point, something uh, the philosopher Chantal Mouffe talks about. So although there is no ultimate or universal common good, we need to refer to this idea when we act collectively. Um, so the question becomes like, how do we do that? And uh, I think that's where the idea of the commons comes into play. 
Yeah, commons are also a major concept in many debates around post-growth and the connection to urban urban issues, urban planning, spatial planning. From your experiences, how would you frame the relevance of commons and of commoning to remove a growth orientation or even growth fetish, as some call it, from local governance and from spatial planning? Yeah, so the idea of the commons, what I understand it as, is it basically opens up a new space for politics. Uh, so one of the main barriers that I saw in the food policy councils, um, uh, their attempts to uh, common governance at the local level was sort of a lack of imagination or willingness to take risks uh, in local governance from mostly municipalities. Um, and yeah, it's it's just like I was talking about this range of politics that we tend to think about in Western countries tends to be either governance by the market or governance by the state. Um, Commons uh, invites us to think in a much more radically democratic way about uh, governance. So if we want to move beyond a growth orientation, what do we actually want to fill that space with? And that's kind of where this idea of radical democracy uh, comes into place. Like you can't determine that in advance, I wouldn't say. It's a, a process of, well, becoming a community that then articulates uh, a certain good together and that that's not something that can be you know defined by some all-knowing central planner or some perfectly designed system with all the levers in place um it's it's commenting as a as a process as a messy process um and i think yeah that's that's a really important uh, notion for uh, local governance and spatial planning is, is keeping things open and uh, focusing on the process rather than some predetermined idea of what a space is or should be. How can we foster more of these messy processes to maybe happen in the first instance and then also deliver something that tends to be better, more towards the common good than the, the other established state or market approaches? That's a good question. I think uh, an idea that's out there is uh, the idea of a public commons partnership. That's something uh, scholars like uh, Bertie Russell and Keir Milburn, some researchers from the UK have talked a lot about. Um, and that's basically the idea that uh, you would have the state sort of seed control of a resource or of a, of a, a basically a service to a community group or a civic initiative um, to basically empower them to um, govern over a resource. Uh, an example for my research, I guess, is a potential for this to happen that never really materialized. It was in Berlin, uh, the Food Policy Council uh, had come up with this idea of a house of food for the city. So that was basically like a hub where you would have uh, education about uh, food sourcing, about cooking, about um, basically yeah, how to become more of a democratic citizen. Also, uh, these were all things that they thought about. Um, And there was something the city was really interested in, and, and there was sort of a push for this project. But in the end, uh, when they developed this house of food, it was something that was um, then ceded to a sort of a private firm to manage rather than the civic group that had come up with the idea. And the result of that was something that was much more narrow uh, rather than this sort of holistic uh, sort of open food hub. And it was Well, eventually, in the end, just something where they were going to train cooks uh, of of the city how to cook in a in a more healthy or sustainable kind of way. Um, so, yeah, I guess just having this willingness to to take risks and to cede some control, um, which yeah, it, it is risky, <laughs> and you do need um, public support to do that. So, I guess it's it's both on the one hand uh, willingness to take risks from institutions and it's also a sort of a social mobilization to give support uh, for that risk taking on the on the behalf of people it means also there is some cooptation that can happen um, some diversion of good intentions maybe then to to some of the traditional forms of let's say economic benefits do you mm -hmm. see major well, obstacles how we could change such tendencies or better ensure that i mean risk also means that can fail, but to have fewer of these failures? I think an interesting thing to think about is like, what is the role of, of researchers or academia in this, in this relationship? So I mentioned willingness to take risks. 
<clears throat> on the behalf of authorities or institutions and then like a social mobilization from people. Um, I think researchers can play an interesting bridge in that. And that's also something that I've kind of tried to do in my research or in my, uh, in my PhD um, with uh, setting up this um, Food Policy Council uh, con Congress or conference. But basically, um, one problem that these groups can run into is that they're not taken seriously by, by institutions. The institutions see what they're doing and they, they don't really know what to do. Is this legitimate if we give them control, this kind of thing? Who are these people? Um, these kind of questions arise. And I think what you can do then is uh, as a, um, a university employee or someone associated with academia, you can sort of uh, help grant legitimacy to certain projects um, that you see as, uh, as promising. That's something that came up in the food policy research as well, because um, often you would have groups of citizens going to a municipality and saying, hey, we, we wanna set this uh, food policy council up to sort of advocate for um, more sustainable uh, food systems. And this is what you could do as a municipality. Often they weren't taken seriously uh, until somebody with uh, some like name recognition would sort of, uh, you know, push that in the right direction. Uh, we saw that in Frankfurt, I, I think, in my uh, case study. And um, yeah, it's something that we tried to, to rectify with setting up this conf uh, conference. So I think that's an opportunity um, to kind of bridge this gap and then say, hey, we don't know for, for sure that this is going to work, but it's an important thing. And um, yeah, we should all try to figure it out together. It puts universities, academics... And also us to quite a central position and also to quite a political position to, to think about the relevance of what we do for society, but not in a linear relationship, but in a quite critical, open, democratic way where yeah, we also take risks potentially. And that is, I think, what we also discussed a bit in October on your PhD defense. Your PhD book was called Tending to Seeds of Civic Activity. And you devote a full chapter to the Minajiro University, to the way how knowledge is produced um, in projects. You also have a nice subheading, heading, don't bite the hand that funds you. So what does this mean for the quest to develop and anchor also different type of policy making, different type of planning, like post-growth planning, also in the way how we do research, how we do especially PhD research like you did over the past years? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess uh, for me, what this means is we need to actually think about what we're doing as, as researchers and academics in practice. Um, so I was involved in this RECOMS project um, and uh, stands for Resourceful and Resilient Communities. And there was a constant focus and discussion about impact. Like how can we have impact on, on the real world and sustainability issues? Um, they had an explicit goal of like supporting vulnerable communities um, to basically transform in the face of, of these crises, social and e ecological crises. Um, but in practice, it was um, we were noticing that me and, and other colleagues were noticing that this isn't really what was driving our, our daily work. It was more um, sort of filling out these checklists uh, of deliverables that we needed to do for the U European Commission. And this doesn't have to be um, inherently opposed to supporting communities, but it's just in practice when you're given a, a fixed amount of time to uh, accomplish something like, for example, writing four papers, uh, and you have messy and complex circumstances. Uh, as we noticed in our uh, three years, we had the, the pandemic and, uh, well, in the end, what you're doing then is, is just figuring out ways to, to tick the boxes rather than um, uh, taking opportunity to yeah, really work to make impact. Um, so again, here, I would say a more open-ended approach, uh, not confined to these predetermined metrics. Um, and you might think about other forms of output too. So like what other things could you do in three or four years besides just try to write three to four published papers? And um, one example here for, for PhDs, um, I think you could draw inspiration from something happening in, in Ghent at uh, the Staats Academy, um, which is uh, a sort of a, a transdisciplinary research project 
that connects like municipal government uh, government with the University of Ghent and also like um, uh, non-academic actors, so civ civic groups, community groups. And they have something called the Master's Thesis Atelier. Atelier. I think I'm pronouncing that right. My French isn't so good, but uh, it's basically like uh, a, a trajectory where master's students will uh, work together in a group with other master's students from different disciplines and their supervisors from different disciplines. And they focus on one concrete problem in the city. And uh, it's what they, I think, call a wicked, uh, wicked problems in the city. Uh, focused on sustainability transitions and basically yeah what they what they say is like we're going to bring this group together and through this process we're going to explore what kind of impact we could have on that issue and that process is is the research and of course there's a write-up of that um, but it's not just focused on um, you know researching something or, or doing interviews and then sort of reporting back or, or, or that kind of thing. It's actually focused on this concrete issue and exploring um, not only in academia, but beyond it, how can we address that issue together? You have positioned yourself also in your PhD defense and some parts of your writing rather critical towards forced creativity uh, in research, towards some of the metrics uh, that the Minidira University uses and also dangers of things like art washing, funding tricks that might happen to achieve goals that are predetermined. On the other side, can you envision alternatives, other kind of products, other kind of deliverables um, with all the critical use of these terms to remain open, transparent, engaged in society, but on the other side, also positioning academia maybe towards something like slow research, research that engages in depth with um, elements of, of real life, And, and then also maybe even learn more from for theory from there than from adding an amount of similar deliverables. Yeah, yeah, I think, well, you mentioned the art washing and the funding tricks that will be called um, different examples of forced creativity. That's, I think, coming from this, um, well, idea that you have to accomplish these um, these metrics in a short amount of time, and there's a lot of pressure to do so. Um, People's economic survival is depending on that. Their future career is depending on that. And this growth logic, it, it dominates academia. So it's always focused on more students, more funding, more publications, uh, getting the next position at the end of your temporary contract. Um, and this, I guess, creates a lot of perverse incentives, uh, obviously. Um, one is kind of in, encouraged to sell their own research um, or sort of promote what they're doing, um, exaggerate that. And um, yeah, that, that has a lot of perverse incentives when you talk about uh, going out into the world and, and trying to actually make an impact. Um, it it kind of tends towards an extractive relationship with, with people. Um, and I guess, um, yeah, what could we do differently? I think young researchers should, should be bold and, and, and try to take on these um, really what are messy and, and difficult and maybe impossible uh, tasks, but there's a lot you can learn from that, I think. And there's a lot um, that, uh, yeah, we can garner from that uh, for theory and, and, and for practice. And again, this idea of, of allowing people to take risks and um, yeah, moving beyond an idea of, of just neutrality and research. So I think, um, it's okay to have a normative orientation, and I think it's important, um, but that doesn't mean that you don't maintain your scientific integrity and rigor and uh, intellectual honesty. And I think that's maybe something that the older generation often doesn't, doesn't recognize as much. Um, not all the time, but um, something I notice uh, at the university here. So yeah, maybe just a more explicit normative approach um, would, um, yeah, improve how we, how we, uh, look at research and how we sort of build re research relationships with, um, people outside of the academy. And, uh, that Stats Academy example in Ghent, I think, again, is a really good example of how that could look. I think we touched upon a very crucial question there. That is, uh, the question of risks on the side of academia and also the way in 
how we do research and how we use the options we have to change things as academia is one of the fields that it puts high value on self-governing bodies, on self-organization within academia that at least on paper tells we have own standards that we follow. So I would say that means there is a lot of change from within possible if we set some of the standards by ourselves. But it may also be the most challenging message to say we have leverage points in our our kind of immediate environment, especially as the more established ones who um, don't have to start on a new position. Yeah. Do you have maybe recommendations what the more established people, bodies, councils can actually do provide to enable more of uh, this risk taking, to enable then more of this honest connection to real life examples, to citizens, to count comments and so forth. Yeah, I guess it, it means for them also taking risks, you know, maybe not career risks as such if they have permanent positions, but um, a risk to go outside of the norm a little bit. Um, again, like I said, I think a lot of older generation is, is uh, fixed to this idea that um, social science or, or planning disciplines need to sort of model themselves after natural science and as, as in doing so be uh, beyond neutrality and beyond value orientation and that kind of stuff. So, um, yeah, um, I would say uh, recognizing that um, social, social research uh, contains value assumptions and normative approaches, whether you like it or not. And that um, to be yeah, bold in, in, uh, in pursuing those um, while maintaining openness and, and scientific integrity and all the, all the rest. But um, yeah, take risks to allow others to take risks. I guess that's otherwise, what's the point of, of having a, a powerful position with um, yeah, academic freedom. What you say, this also means universities should be even more locations where really critical democratic debates about radical alternatives happen, where researchers, students, PhDs are allowed to take risks in thinking at first, but maybe then also risks in relating to um, public challenges. Yeah, for sure. I think uh, we need to have universities be open places of debate, uh, and and thinking about uh, alternatives and experimenting with them as well, yeah, for sure. So looking back a bit, it's only it's a few years ago since you entered university as a PhD researcher. You have finished that, uh, but what could be maybe crucial to encourage young researchers, especially those that are new, uh, that start to become these seeds of change, instead of um, kind of getting getting lost and then maybe trying to find their relevance throughout, throughout their research. Yeah, it's, it's tough. Um, I think, I don't know if I could give um, really clear advice. I think um, just being bold and, and asking yourself why you're, you're doing um, this type of research. So of course there's many types of research, not every type of research I don't think has to be taking such an orientation. Um, but in my own uh, experience in the project I was in, that was the explicit aim of the project. And um, it would have been also easy to just kind of put my head down and, and say, hey, I know this might not really be achieving impact or a sort of impact that I would identify with, um, but well, I'll just, just go ahead with it and, and you know have my, my career and, and do what I need to do. Um, but I, I didn't think that was something that I could really uh, get behind or, or feel good about. So yeah, I would say just be bold and, and stay true to uh, the uh, motivations that you have. And maybe some people are motivated by their career and that's, that's fine. But um, well, I think uh, a lot of people aren't. And that was my experience uh, with the Recoms project is you had a, a lot of young people that were looking to uh, actually, yeah, make an impact uh, through science and through, connecting uh, academia to real world issues. Um, so I would encourage people to just yeah take a risk <laughs> again and, and be bold with it. Yeah, Stay I totally, totally agree with you. There is should be a huge value on intrinsic motivation on trying out new things, experimenting, um, which means the risks. I mean, natural science have the debate about how to deal with failed experiments that are usually not well published. 
Um, I think we have the similar challenge of how to deal with the messiness and that things may not be that easy or may not work at all, even though we have put a lot of effort in them. Uh, so that remains a challenge, I'm sure. And that is also a challenge within the debate around post growth planning, how to deal with the openness of uh, that the future is not fully developed yet, but that we have the idea that we should move there, though we don't really know the final end product. In principle, that's a core definition of research. As I think both of us agree, if we knew yeah. the result already, it wouldn't be open research. Exactly. Um, yeah. What would you say to get, get back to post-growth and planning? If you try to finish the sentence with your background, post-growth planning is? I would say uh, post-growth planning is a good opening statement. So um, it's, yeah, it's the statement that we need to go beyond a sole focus on GDP and like a narrow idea of economic growth. But it's also a start or an opening statement because the challenge is where will we move towards? And that's That's what we need to figure out, I think, um, as we, we both have kind of just alluded to in practice or in praxis. Thanks a lot, Stephen. It's great to hear that we are also part of that in academia. So we talked a lot also about our own positions, the way how we do research, the way how we take risks, the way how society can take risks. So thanks for sharing your insights and all the best for your current position at University College Groningen and also your new tasks coming up at University of Wageningen over the coming month. Thank you, Christian. Thanks for having me. Thank you.